Excellent. Hello, everybody. It's Dawn Fotopoulos, and I am so thrilled to be here and thrilled that you're here because we're going to talk about bankers and investors from an insider's perspective. I want to pull the screen aside and teach you how to be super savvy whenever you're talking to a banker or an investor. And I spent a lot of my life as a vice president for one of the big banks here in New York. So I want to make you so knowledgeable and so aware that you're going to get the deal that you need to grow your business and grow your profitability. So how do you influence them? You got to start thinking like them. So let's take you through. First of all, who am I? I'm a professor of business at the King's College, as Alexa said, but accounting for the number phobic, a survival guide for small business owners is in three languages, English, Chinese, and Spanish, and it won Best Business Book of 2015 for one important reason. It's actually a funny book on accounting. It's illustrated by a Disney artist, and if you're afraid of numbers, you're in good company because most people are, but the numbers are your business. And if you're going to talk to a banker and investor, they're all about the numbers. So you need to speak their language in order for you to be able to build a bridge with them. The book will help you do that. But those lovely ladies that are in the frame with me in the photograph are their engineers and bridge builders. And I love them. They're entrepreneurs just like you. And a lot of them have come back to me to say, you know what, this has been super helpful. So just know that's a resource for you. I want to give a a shout out to our sponsors. These are the people and the organizations that have gone to bat to bring this presentation to you. The SCORE organization is a spectacular organization. They have 350 offices across the United States, and they are not only, they not only offer the premier source of confidential small business advice, but it is free. That's right, free. No strings. All of this unbelievable treasure trove of talent and wisdom available to you for no cost. And so you need to become very familiar both with SCORE offline as well as online. They have a very robust service online for mentorship and anything, frankly, that you need. I want to thank a special thank you to FedEx that has the most unbelievable distribution network in the world. You know this company, but you probably don't know everything about them. They will connect you to 99% of the world's GDP, which is incredible. They ship over 12 million shipments every single business day. And what you don't know is they have unbelievable packaging expertise. They have incredible customers expertise and e-commerce expertise, okay? And a lot of people don't know this. But if you want to expand your markets across border, you can have no better strategic partner than FedEx. And they also have small business peer advice. And if you stay with me toward, to the end of this presentation, there's a very, very special offer that FedEx has for you. So don't miss it. Stay with me and let's continue on how to influence bankers and investors. So here's the problem, okay? And the problem is your cost of capital is in all likelihood way too high. What's cost of capital? It's the interest and fees that you pay on the loans that you take out against your business. So Mo Abdu, who's this very happy fellow over here, interviewed me a couple years ago, and he told me something that I didn't know until we chatted. He said most small business owners are paying, are you ready for this? Twice what they should be for the cost of capital. He said funding companies are taking advantage, and they are, and it's time to stop the madness, okay? And, and I want to show you exactly why you're probably paying too much for loans and what we can do about it, okay? So the challenge here is this. If, you're, if you happen to be spending two to three times what you should be in interest fees and so on, that cash that's getting sucked out of your business, I want you to understand at a gut level what's really going on. There are so many more productive uses for that cash instead of just overpaying for a loan. You could be investing in marketing. You could be investing in training, advertising, new technology, website upgrades, new product development, new market distributions, okay? So we want you to conserve cash to use it for you and for the business, not to overpay for loans. So what's the solution? You gotta get savvy, and how do we do that? So here's the agenda for today. 
I want you to gain right perspective. I want you to think like a banker or an investor. So we're going to turn the tables, basically, and you're going to make believe that you're a banker and an investor talking to somebody just like you who's a business owner. You need to know your numbers because guess what? The people that hold the purse strings have the power. They don't need to speak your language. You need to speak theirs. So, and to some of you, it's like going to a foreign country. But I'm going to take you through some of your numbers. And when we talk about know your numbers, I'm going to tell you specifically what numbers you need to have under your belt. And it will help you in this webinar. And if you need more information, you can get that through Number Phobic. Um, so at any rate, you got to know your customers. And not just know who you're doing business with, but really know them. And I'll tell you how and why. you got to know your competition. Not all your competition but the most important competitors where if people aren't buying from you or companies aren't buying from you, what's the short list that they look at that they are buying from? And you got to prepare before you show up or you're going to lose the deal. And then, of course, vision the future. So the sum of all of today is going to take you through a drill. Every banker and investor is going to take you through a series of questions. It's like going for a job interview. You can prepare for them. And there's going to be a much higher likelihood you're going to get a higher closure rate. And then I want to leave you with some resources. Uh, this is a recorded presentation. That's the great news. So if you know somebody who could benefit from this and they're not on the call, you can let them know that this is available to them 24-7. And we thank the SCORE and the FedEx organizations for making that av available. So, okay, there's a difference between a banker and an investor. I just want to define these for you, okay? Let's understand, and I know this is my New York cynicism coming out, a banker and an investor is not there to help you. I know. You think they are, and they'll tell you that they are, but in truth, they're really there to make money. And making money is not a bad thing, okay? If they do make money, then that means they have a larger portfolio that they can loan out to more and more businesses and help those businesses grow and prosper. So we want this to happen, but at the end of the day, bankers and investors are risk managers. What they're doing is they're looking at all the alternative investments that are out there that are being presented to them, and they're trying to make the best choices because they can't loan money to everybody that's asking for it. So remember, their primary purpose is to manage risk. And so what we have to do is help them manage risk so they make the best decisions. And we need to present ourselves so that our businesses are, in fact, the best alternative for their portfolio. Okay, so let's talk about gaining right perspectives. The first thing is I know we're all passionate about our businesses, and that's a great thing. But the most important thing is passion is the minimum cost of entry, okay? Passion isn't going to get you the deal. You have to be passionate about your business to persevere. But investors care about making money and managing the downsides, which is that risk I was just talking about. So remember something, just growing your business is not a strategy. You have to learn how to protect your flanks from competition, and you have to have a plan for growing your profitability and your cash flow because that's everything. What does that do? That proves to a banker or an investor that you're not only a good credit risk, but the likelihood that you're going to pay back that loan or they're going to get a return on investment for, uh, for the investment that they're making in your business is very, very high. So ultimately what we're after is we need to prove that your business is the best option for their portfolio. Okay? So let's keep going. This guy, David S. Rose, is a very smart man. And he's in charge of one of the biggest incubators here in New York City. He's invested in thousands of companies. And he's one of the most successful because he has one of the best track records. But even David S. Rose, okay, only gets a return, a huge return on investment, one out of 200 times. So he knows this, and he does his homework. He looks at the numbers. He does his research, all of that. So even the best investors don't have a, a, a tremendous track record, but when he does have a win. It's a huge win. But what is he looking for as an investor? If he puts $100,000 into a business, he expects $2 million back in two years. And I'm going to say that one more time because that's a staggering increase, right? If he puts $100,000 and he wants $2 million back, that's from an investor standpoint, not a bank. So in order to do that, 
your equity has to grow like a thousand percent a year or, or a ten times per year, and most business owners don't get the deal. The only time you should be looking at an investor is when you're sitting on so many customer orders and you need the money to fulfill the orders. In other words, the revenues are already baked in. But preparation is super duper important. So what do bankers care about? These are the questions they ask themselves, and these are the questions you should be willing to answer before you even have the conversation. Is your company, are you the best investment that they can make at this time? So let's be clear. When a David S. Rose is looking at an investment, he's got a hundred investments sitting on his desk at the same time. And then he's going to ask, are you a worthy credit risk or are there other businesses that can provide the same return with less risk? Again, these are very, very careful people. They want to manage their downside. And then from a, from a banker's standpoint, the loan officer, every time the loan officer approves a loan, his job is or her job is on the line. You know this, right? Because if the loan goes south, it's their reputation that's on the line. So the loan officer is basically going to ask a couple of questions. They have to rationalize and they have to prove to their bosses that you're a really good credit risk. So can the loan officer convince his or her boss that you should get the loan? And if you receive the loan, Will the loan officer get a promotion because you've done such a good job managing that loan, or will they get fired because the loan goes south and you're unable to service the loan? So that's what the loan officer cares about. So what's the likelihood that given your past performance, you will pay the loan back, you're going to pay it on time, and you're going to pay it with interest? That's what the loan officer cares about. So we know what the investors care about because we heard from David S. Rose, and now we're thinking about the loan officer. So I want you to change your mindset, okay? It's not about your business, even though it is ultimately. Initially, it's really about the return on investment that your business can provide. What does that mean? It means your business is an engine. It's a value and a profit and a cash flow creating engine. You're taking something from nothing, you're developing new products and services, you're offering it to the world, you're charging for it, and you're developing a customer base, people are paying you for it, and the question is, is that engine going to go from point A to point B without sputtering out? So you got to prove it, okay? you got to prove that the engine is working and the engine is viable. So preparation is super important, as I said earlier. You want to put your best foot forward and you want to do it in the first conversation, which means that you can't go in there half-baked. So what, what kind of preparation am I talking about? And I talked about this earlier in our agenda. You got to know your numbers. You got to know your customers. You got to know your competition, and you got to vision the future. That's the arc of the conversation and the application when you're applying either for a loan or for an investment. So knowing your numbers. There are three key questions you got to answer and you got to answer it cold and if you can't you got to sit with your bookkeeper or accountant and you got to ask these questions and they will pull the data for you and they'll go through it with you but you've got to know the answers are you making money that is are you generating profitability and if you are how much are you generating and how has it changed over time if it's increasing that's a good thing if it's de decreasing you got to figure out why and what to do about it do you have enough cash to pay the bills you're going to get the answer to that with your cash flow statement. So the first question is going to be answered by your net income statement. Second question by your cash flow statement. And, and by the way, cash is to your business as blood is to your body. Without blood, you don't survive. Without cash, your business doesn't survive. The first thing an investor or a banker is going to look at is your cash flow. So you got to know, do you have enough cash to pay the bills? and at least enough cash to cover 90 days of operating expenses. So I'm going to tell you something no one's ever going to tell you, okay? But it's true. You don't ask for a loan when you need the money. That sounds a little counterintuitive, doesn't it? But you don't. Because if you're in a cash crunch, you look like a bad credit risk. The time you ask for a loan or a credit line is when you don't need it. Okay, so do you have enough cash to pay the bills? And then last but not least, are you building wealth or destroying it? Your balance sheet's going to answer that question. 
Okay, knowing your customers, what do you need to know about them? You need to know why they buy from you instead of your competition because that's your competitive advantage. How easy is it for your, cust uh, for your competitors to copy you? How easy is it for your com customers to become your competitors? And how loyal are your customers to your brand? So if you have a thousand customers, that doesn't give enough information. Do they buy from you 10 times a year? That tells me something as an investor. That tells me you got real traction. If you have a thousand customers and they leave you every year and you have to find another thousand customers to keep the business going, that also tells me you're not doing a great job at customer relationship management. So we need to answer those three questions on customers, on competition, where is the competition falling short? Where are they not doing the job? And every competitor that competes directly with you has an Achilles heel and you got to find it. And then you got to compare the total customer experience doing business with your company versus doing business with your competition because you're not just competing on the product or service. It's the entire customer experience. And you need to look at how do you handle customers before the sale, during the sale, and after the sale. That's the entire arc of the customer experience. And then in terms of visioning the future, why should demand increase? Because don't forget, an investor or a banker is investing in the future, not the past. They're looking at the past to see if they can rationalize investing in you today, but ultimately the return on investment for them is going to come in the future. So megatrends. What's happening with demand? How will you leverage technology to gain the advantage? And what do you have in the pipeline regarding new customers and new products and services? So you got to know your numbers. Don't become shark bait. Little Pim, Julia Pimsler, who's a brilliant lady, lost a million dollar deal because an investor asked her what gross margin was. And she said, I knew what margin was. I didn't know what gross margin was. And she lost it. Just for the record, friends, gross margin and margin are the same thing. Okay, so don't you lose a million dollar deal because you don't know. Here's your financial dashboard. Your net income statements, your speedometer. How quickly are you and how effectively are you generating profitability? Your, ca your gas tank is your cash flow statement and your oil pressure gauge is your balance sheet. How much debt do you have and how much can your business actually handle? And number phobic, these are all illustrations, by the way, taken from number phobic. So at any rate, are you making money? Do you have enough cash? Are you building wealth or destroying it? Your, your uh, net income statement is basically the money in, money out, what's left over. Your cash flow statement is cash in, cash out, and balance forward. Your balance sheet is really important because that's your net worth statement. And you know what? You have a net worth statement. Even personally, you have this. So assets, what do you own? What can be converted into cash minus the liabilities? This is what you owe already before you apply for a loan is your net worth. Now, this net worth, by the way, can be positive or it could be negative. It should be positive before you ever speak to an investor or a banker. But that's the broad brush of your numbers. So if you need more data and information, go to the financial dashboard, your key to, to small business success. It is a webinar that we did sponsored by FedEx uh, and published by SCORE. It's on SCORE.org, and you got to tell the world, but you should watch that webinar. It's recorded for you and available. So if you need more uh, in-depth background on knowing your numbers, this is a great place to start. It's the best 40-minute investment of your life. Okay, know your customers, your revenues today, and what you think they're going to be tomorrow. So I asked you this question earlier, what do customers buy from you instead of the competition? It doesn't matter what you think, it matters what they believe. So if you're not sure, you got to ask them. Take your top five customers and ask them and do it and don't be shy because we've learned some very interesting things when we've asked those questions. So one business owner said, one of her customers said you were the cheapest by far, which of course means she's leaving way too much money on the table and underpricing herself. Another customer said, and it was actually a very touching moment, he turned to the guy that he was doing business with and he said, you know, you're the only one who took me seriously. He's a man who happened to have been uh, a, a paraplegic and a very smart man and he was in real estate and he said you were the only one who took me seriously 
And the guy that he did business with did tens of millions of dollars of business with him. And another said, you saved my business. So remember something, my friends, you get paid for what you deliver, not what you do, what you deliver to your customers. And that's the whole experience. If you want to know more about pricing your products and services, you got to watch The Power of Pricing, which is yet another webinar that's available to you 24-7 at SCORE.org. So let's talk more about knowing your customers. You got to know who's buying from you. And if they have a high profile, like a brand name, you got to leverage that brand. So once upon a time, many years ago, I did business with Lands End Yacht Stores. And they're fabulous people to do business with. And whenever I presented to a new retailer, I always told them we were doing business with Lands End. And that even though we weren't known, our customers were known, and it really helped us. You need to know what the average sale size is, and is that getting bigger or smaller. You need to know your product mix and what your gross margin is per sale because your gross margin is your gross profit. You need to know how frequently they purchase from you. You need to know what percentage of them are repeat purchasers because that's a proxy for loyalty. And you need to know if you have any apostles, people that are out there just talking about you on social media. Any of those testimonials you need to capture because it's a demonstration to an investor or a banker, hey, these guys are really doing the job. What you also want is you want customer-based diversification. What do I mean by that? If you have 100 customers and one of those customers does 80% of your business, that puts your business at risk. And any investor and banker is going to look at that and go, hey, what happens if you lose that big customer? So you want no one customer to hold your business hostage. So don't be the dog that caught the bus, okay? Make sure you have diversification in your client base. Know your customer buying behavior. This is a money slide, friends, and you need to spend some time on this after the webinar. Why do they buy? What do they buy? When do they buy? How do they buy? How often do they buy? How often do they refer? This is a big deal because this is telling your investor or banker if they are, if your stuff is going viral, and then where are your testimonials? And you need to present those online and offline everywhere you can, including on the back of your business card, by the way. Revenue risk. Okay, so if this is what drives revenues, what is going to put your revenues at risk? How easy is for it? Uh, how easy is it for competition to copy you? How loyal are your customers? What is your attrition rate per year? With your customer base, if it's over 5% or maybe even 10%, you got a problem. You should know what that attrition rate is. And then what are influencers saying about your brand? Because that is also helpful for testimonials. How do you measure customer satisfaction? And last but not least, remember this forever and ever, a 5% improvement in retention of a profitable customer can increase your bottom line by 25 to 85%. And your investors know this, by the way. So if you have a low attrition rate, they know that instantly, if your attrition rate's lower than your competition, you have competitive advantage. So what are customers saying about their experience doing business with you? Those testimonials have to be captured. Okay, know your competition, because you're going to lower investor risk if you do. Find the weaknesses. Have you become a customer of your competitors? What have customers, your customers, and suppliers revealed about your competitors? Treasure trove of competitive research. Compare your total customer experience before, during, and after the sale. You heard me say that. And how are your competitors presenting and marketing online, and where are they doing a poor job? If you can find that Achilles heel and they have them, you're going to prove your company is a better investment. So here's the drill. This is an amazing lady, Kelly McCollum. I love her. She is the co-founder of Yellow Scope. She is also the FedEx Small Business Grant Contest winner. And she also is a FedEx Entrepreneur Advisory Board member. I had the privilege of meeting her face-to-face. -face. And this woman is a scientist. Yellow Scope creates um, a kit, science kits for young women to give them uh, some STEM background and confidence to go into STEM careers. So, are you uniquely qualified to run this business? She has corporate experience, formal education. She's a PhD, if I'm not mistaken, um, a specialized or transferable knowledge. If you run a pilot program and you have data and results from that, by all means, bring it up. 
And if you have any high-profile endorsements, of course, Oprah Winfrey is like the best in the world. But if anybody in your discipline speaks well of you, by all means, you need to bring that up. So this is your personal brand. You're the jockey on the horse, and the banker or investor wants to know, are they investing in a good jockey? So you got to know yourself, why you exist, and what your uniqueness is. you got to know your ecosystem. That's the competition and also the future demographic shifts. Know the mega trends driving demand and expenses. You got to know your marketing strategy also because that, again, is your forecasting. That's your future, where your strengths and weaknesses are. You got to know your numbers cold, but most importantly, you got to know the trends in your numbers and you got to know your risks. So you got to be honest with them. Say, listen, you know what? We tried this, it didn't work, but this is what we're going to learn going forward. And most importantly, if somebody gives you money, as an investor or banker, you got to be super clear on how you're going to allocate that money. If you're going to say, I just want to buy myself a really expensive car, I promise you, you won't get the deal. And don't laugh because there was a guy pitching investors on Shark Tank that basically said that. So know what the uses of the funds are going to be. So remember, investors and bankers are buying the upside. So again, where is demand coming from? How do you think competition is going to respond to those changes? Okay, how will you leverage technology and what do you have in the pipeline in terms of sales and growth? And then where is profit, cash flow, and debt trending if you grow? Because sometimes you can actually grow your problem. So growth is not a strategy. You want to grow your profit and cash flow. Visioning the future. Now, here's the guy who sells beard oil. And, yes, it's a whole counterculture, a whole subculture. And he was one of the largest sellers on Etsy. When I'm, as an investor or banker, asking somebody about their customer base, I ask them, do you own the customer or is there a third party like Amazon or Etsy that owns the customer? Because this guy uh, actually had a lot of hard, he had a hard time building his customer base because Etsy was basically holding his client base hostage. Amazon has the potential to do the same thing, by the way. So just be very careful. You want to know exactly who you're doing business with, and you want to control those relationships. So what are the questions any thinking banker or investor is going to ask? And they come in these categories. What's going on with your revenues? What's going on with gross margin? That's your gross profit. How are you distributing what you're doing? How do you get the word out? What are your expenses, your operating expenses? What are your direct costs, your operating costs? And then sources and uses of funds, which I mentioned a minute ago, what's happening in the future, and then I'm going to give you a survival checklist. Okay. So, again, where are your sales? Where are they trending? Who's your primary customer? And how satisfied are your customers? And then you got to prove it. Okay? And testimonials are very important because it's a third party talking about you, not you talking about yourself. But you want to know things like how much are you charging versus your competition, and what is their a seasonality of sales? Most businesses and industries have a seasonality, and um, you got to know when your week periods are and be honest about that. But then it's another very important question. How easy or difficult is it for competition to steal your customers? Okay. So if you want to know how do you think about gross margin, Accounting for the number phobic will find your sanity and really help you in these conversations. But remember something, you run your business on gross margin, you don't run it on sales. So here's a question for you, and this is a good question a banker could ask. How much gross margin does each of your business lines generate? And if you had to improve gross margin by 10%, how would you do it? I ask this question all the time. And if a business owner can't answer it, it tells me they don't know their numbers. Okay, and accounting for the number phobic will take you through it in detail, but so will the webinar on knowing your numbers on score.org. How do you distribute your product? Do you have strategic partners that are high profile? Third-party retailers, what's your sell-through? What outlets are growing? What's your online marketing strategy? All of these things, really, you should have in a business plan that you can bring to the table. So expenses. How much does it cost you to deliver your product or service? How much does it cost you? Those are your direct costs. How much does it cost you to run the company? And then how does your cost structure compare to the industry average? 
Are any of your fixed or variable costs out of line? And typically, fixed and variable costs are calculated as a percentage of revenue. For every dollar of sales you bring in, how much of that do you pay in rent? How much of that do you allocate for marketing? Usually, marketing is about 20% of sales. So, last but not least, drum roll, please, if you don't know the answer to this, find the answer to it. What is your cost to acquire a single new customer? What does it cost you to do that? And if your cost of acquisition is going down, it means your marketing is becoming more efficient. Okay, so I talked to you earlier about sources and uses of funds. I'm not going to stay spend a whole lot of time on this, but if you want to pay yourself a higher salary, do not bring that up in the conversation. We talked also about visioning the future. Why is that important? Because even though you may have been successful in the past, super important that an investor or a banker doesn't think you're a one-hit wonder that you have in the pipeline, that there's a reason why this engine is going to continue to flow and be viable and generate profitability and cash flow. So let's talk about a survival checklist, okay? And this is the acid test. If you had to reduce expenses by 15% to keep the business alive, what would you cut? You don't know the answer to that. You should find out the answer to that. Talk to your accountant or your bookkeeper or a SCORE mentor. You should do some stress testing before you're in distress. If you had to improve gross margin by 5% or 10% to survive, what three ways could you do to improve this? And then what steps are you taking to own and to nurture your customer relationships? So again, this is the drill checklist. Why are you uniquely qualified to run the business? What are your sales? How are they trending? How much does it cost you to deliver it? How much money do you have invested in the business? Envision the future. Why should somebody invest right now? Okay, that's the key because, again, their upside is in the future. So how do you prove it? You're going to prove it three ways. Capturing all your customer testimonials. And, by the way, this is not a time for humility. <laughs> you got to toot your own horn. And customers who love you, and I know you have them, Capture what they say, okay, because the world needs to hear from them about you. You have any strategic partnerships? FedEx is my strategic partner, and I love them. I love doing business with them, and we're on a mission to double small business survival rates, and I couldn't be more thrilled to work with these amazing people. And the same with the SCORE organization. Those strategic partnerships mean a whole lot to somebody who doesn't know you. And if you have any influencer who's endorsing you, go look on social, see who's talking about you, and capture those as well, because it really matters. So on, as a final word, I just want to say a couple of things, all right? The right marriage really matters. you got to find a banker or an investor who has at least 10 years of experience in your niche and industry. So you're interviewing them as much as they're interviewing you. And if you have a banker or an investor that has experience in your industry, they do become strategic partners if they invest in you because they have a vested interest in your success. And they have connections, they have wisdom, they have experience, they've made their mistakes. So they can help coach you as well. So they got to care about your professional development. They could easily open doors to their network on your behalf. And you know what? They're truth tellers. You want to work with people who are going to be honest with you. So um, once a banker seals the deal, they own the risk with you, so now you're co-laboring together. One more thing, once you get the deal, over-communicate with your banker or investor. Tell them all the great stuff that's happening because they're going to get excited with you. Okay, resources. <laughs> I said pinch me, okay? FedEx.com has an area called money management, and it helps you to grow your business. I want to talk to you about the FedEx Small Business Grant Contest. It's amazing. And you can win up to, are you ready for this? $50,000. You could win credit at a FedEx office for printing. It's spectacular exposure for your business. Just by entering, even if you don't win. I've met many, many people that have won these grant contests, and they're incredible. But you've got to enter before March the 2nd, 2020. So make sure you enter. It doesn't cost you anything, and you could gain so, so much. So that's the link, fedex.com slash grant contest. And if you, don't wanna, uh, uh, if you don't wanna apply, but you know other people that do, make sure on your social platforms you talk about it, okay? 
So understanding funding options beyond the bank, this is from ICIC, also one of the beneficiaries of FedEx. Understanding funding options uh, is just a spectacular white paper. It's a PDF, it's free, you can go pick that up. And last but not least is SCORE.org, a treasure trove of information and connections and wisdom for you. The three webinars I, I referenced earlier in this presentation are the power of pricing, what business owners should stop doing to stay sane, five things, and then your financial dashboard. You can find it all on SCORE.org, and the best news is even if there's a SCORE office that's not near you, there is a mentor you can find online. How great is that, okay? So you lose absolutely nothing and have everything to gain by going on SCORE.org and at least exploring what's available for you. David S. Rose is, uh, is all about starting up smarter. I know there are a couple of questions about, uh, about how to handle it with a new startup. Go to gust.com and you'll get some very good information there. Putting the service profit chain to work is a Harvard Business Review reprint. It's free. There's a link there. It's an MBA in 12 pages and honestly worth your time. The number phobic study guide, accounting for the number phobic has a study guide. I'm happy to send it to you as my gift. And all you have to do is go to that link and press on it. And you can automatically download it. If you want more of me, you can find me at dawnfotopolis.com. But you can find me on Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn and, oh, my gosh, all the standard social platforms. And I want to hear from you. I want to hear what's happening in your businesses. So here are some takeaways. Your financial tool the key to your future, and you got to stop ignoring them. Okay, if it just takes you one week to learn what you need to learn, listen to the webinar. You can buy the book. You don't have to. This is not about pressuring you to do that, but it is a really good reference book, and it will make the conversations that you have with your bookkeeper and your accountant so, so much more valuable. But at any rate, facts are better than dreams, and make your accounting professional your strategic partner. But your banker and your investor can be that too. So learn the basics and build a bridge with your accounting pro and laugh while you're doing it. So at any rate, here are some of the testimonials on number phobic, which I won't bore you with, but a couple of them that I just thought were so wonderful. Someone said, I wish I had this book 40 years ago when I started my business. It would have saved me so much heartache. And that's really what I'm about, friends, and that's why FedEx and SCORE are so passionate about this too. If you don't have a bookkeeper or an accountant, go to findaproadvisor.com. That's a free website and put in, your, uh, put in your zip code and look for somebody that has an advanced QuickBooks certification and they will help you get out of the mud and mire of your numbers. And you know, in one week or two weeks, they can really get you on course. So it's enormously valuable. Findaproadvisor.com. You should be reviewing your dashboard monthly. And um, here, where are we? Okay, so takeaways. Review your client base every time you sell a product to a customer. The price you charge needs to jump the gross margin hurdle even after, after discounts. So you've got to align your customer relationship management uh, efforts with your high gross margin clients. Watch the power of pricing at score.org. You can read accounting for the number phobic. Get the free download, which is the study book. Reach out to me, which is my personal email, dphotopoulos at gmail.com. And uh, again, that's the free study guide. When you go on score.org, you have all kinds of opportunities here to get information, find a mentor, and so on. And I want to thank you and thank SCORE and FedEx for giving me the opportunity to give you everything you need to be successful in the marketplace. So at any rate, guys, uh, feel free to type your questions into the question box. We'll get to as many as we can in our time together. We have about another 15 minutes or so. I'm looking at some of the people on the call, and you've been with me before, and I thank you so much, Mark and David and, and LaVilla. I thank you so much for, for joining us today. So I'm going to hand it over to Alexa. I went a little over, so forgive me, Alexa, but I'm happy to answer questions. Okay, sounds good. We'll jump right into these questions. We'll use uh, the remainder of the time to address just as many as we can. 
if we do not have an opportunity to address your question in this live webinar, we'll, we'd like to recommend connecting with your SCORE mentor after today's session who can assist you further with your questions and applying these strategies. We are providing everyone with the slide deck after the webinar is over today. If you have not already downloaded it from within the web player, we'll get that slide deck to you with all of the resources that Dawn has provided to reach out to for further assistance as well. So with that, we'll go ahead and jump right in here, Dawn. Our first question coming to us from Jay asking, what type of credit do they look for in a business loan for an S-Corp, the company credit EIN, or the owner social security number? Hi, Dawn. You still on the line there? Yes, I am. I'm right here. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes Hello? Yep. Okay, yes. perfect. Okay. So I did hear your question, Alexis. So, uh, Jay, this is for you. When a banker or an investor looks at your S Corp, okay, even though you are a corporation, they're going to look at your entire picture, including your personal background. So, again, they're looking at you as an ecosystem. So they're going to want both your EIN as well as your Social Security number because what they want to avoid, and which they have seen in the past, by the way, I've actually had bankers tell me this, where the business looks great, the business is doing really well, but the owner is siphoning off money and buying very expensive houses, taking on tons of debt personally, and they feel that actually puts the business at risk. So they're going to look at both your business background and your EIN number and everything attached to that in terms of debt that has been taken out on behalf of the business. And they're also going to be looking at you personally. So everything is fair game for a, a review with a banker or an investor. Just be aware of that. Okay. This next question here comes to us from Dennis. And Dennis is asking if you have any advice from the lender's perspective on the construction of cash flow statements, balance sheets, et cetera, when you are starting a brand new business from scratch and are guessing at the numbers? Uh, it's a very good question. And what you're basically putting together are forecasts. When I'm a banker and I'm looking at that, the most important thing for me is not the actual statements. It's the assumptions behind those statements. So, why do you think you're going to be able to do $100,000 or $500,000 in sales? Here's the thing. When you're presenting that forecast to a potential investor or banker, what you're really doing is you're saying, um, is you're really giving them a proof of concept, right? So what I would recommend is to run a pilot, a small pilot, a market test or your particular target audience and see what the receptivity is. And if you start to get some traction in that pilot, you use that data to support your assumptions to put together your forecast, okay? And um, what I would do is I would meet with a SCORE mentor that knows all about starting up a business in your particular industry and show them where you are right now in your planning and in your pilot or market test. And let them tell you, well, you know what, you need to run a more extensive market test or, uh, or what you need to do in order to put some assumptions together and then begin to crunch some numbers. Because what's going to happen in those forecasts is you should have not only your assumptions very clear and based on data in your pilot, but you should have worst case scenario, mid case scenario, and best case scenario. Because most entrepreneurs are very optimistic, okay? And what you need to do is to prove that you're still credit worthy in a worst case scenario environment. And what that means is if the bank actually gives you the loan or the investor gives you the money, that there's only upside. But you got to provide a worst case scenario set of assumptions because that's the most conservative scenario. Okay? Okay. Dawn, our next question comes to us from Lara. Lara is asking, how do we determine how our cost structure compares to the industry average? 
That's an excellent question, and I'll tell you who would know the answers. There are a bunch of places you could go to get the answers, Lara. The first is uh, I, a score has a tremendous amount of data that's embedded in those 350 offices. Think about it. They've seen thousands and thousands and thousands of businesses every single year, and I would suspect that there is a building library of, or, of companies just like yours that can give you some, I want to say, industry averages or benchmarks. Another way that you can find that information is speaking to accounting professionals that know those industries very well. A third place you can go are industry trade organizations. Industry trade organizations have a tremendous amount of data and benchmarks. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Can everybody yep. hear? Okay. Okay. Sounds I'm good. sorry because I'm I've got a call coming in. So at any rate, so industry trade organizations. Last but not least, another place that um, uh, another place that you can go is you can go to your business library, your business and science local library. The librarian there is a treasure trove. They're like research assistants. Go to them and say, this is the business that I'm in. These are the benchmarks that I want to understand. Gross margin as a percent to revenues. Uh, bottom line, one of the things I didn't point out, but it's in the slide, that if you really want to prove that you have a healthy business, your bottom line should be 15% of your revenues. In other words, for every dollar of revenue you bring in, you should be generating 15 cents in your bottom line. Nobody ever talks about this. But I would go to all of those various, um, uh, I would put a, like a research plan together and tap into those resources, and they're all free. It's unbelievable. Now, an accounting professional might charge you for their time, but I think they're worth it. But at the end of the day, you can get the information that you need from the industry trade associations, from SCORE, and also from your local science and business library. All right, next question. This is from Fariba asking, what is your advice if your credit score is poor? Okay, so Fariba, that's your personal credit score, I'm guessing, or is it your business credit score? I'm, I'm, I suspect it's your personal credit score. Uh, if your personal credit score is poor, then you have to work a whole lot harder to prove that you're a good credit risk. Okay, and one of the things that you can do is you can improve that credit score within three to six months, and I recommend that that's your focus. Instead of trying to raise money right now, or instead of trying to get a loan right now, you should improve your credit score, because you need to prove that you are a good credit risk, and there are a hundred different agencies and places you can go to improve your credit score, and it doesn't take a whole lot of effort. So um, if you don't do that, the risk to you is that people are going to see you as a high credit risk and they're going to charge you an exorbitant amount of money in interest and in fees, even if you do get the loan. So what's a three-month or six-month investment of your time to improve your credit score? It's really not that much time, and it will save you so, so much money. That would be my advice. Okay, Dawn, our next question is coming to us from Jennifer, asking if you can explain in just a little bit more detail the 5%, 25%, and 85% rule. <laughs> okay, so you know what? That 5, 25, 85% rule comes from the article whose link, that I, uh, whose link I mentioned. It comes from putting the service profit chain to work. Okay, that's sort of the bottom line of that entire article. And what it basically says is the following. If you have a lot of customers, but they buy from you once and they leave and go to your competition, that's not a profitable business. But if you have, if you have, if you're an average business, uh, a third of your customers are profitable, a third of your customers are at break even, and a third of your customers are actually losing you money. <laughs> so what that means is roughly 67% of your entire customer base is unprofitable. And so all customers are not profitable. All customers are not created equal. And profitable how? On a gross margin basis. So they buy $100 from you and you make $30 on every $100 purchase. That's a profitable customer. A customer that's unprofitable, they buy $100 from you, but it costs you 110 in order to service them and to sell whatever you're selling to them. 
The point is this, you need to know A, which customers are profitable in your client base, and you should look at each customer by gross margin. If you don't know that number, ask your bookkeeper or counter to, to crunch them and pull them for you. Don't assume a large customer in sales is a profitable customer because that's not always true. Second thing is, what you want to do is focus your relationship building efforts with those profitable customers. You want to drop deeper roots with them. You want to make sure you maintain long-term relationships with them because they are profitable. So for that top third that generates the most gross margin, that's the 5% you want to maintain. So if you can increase, a, a, increase retention of that profitable top third, it will drop, it will increase your bottom line between 25 and 85% more. It's a positive multiplier effect. So instead of spending all your time getting new customers in your ecosystem, look at the customers that you already have in your client base, segment them according to which ones are profitable, which ones are at break even, which ones are unprofitable, and focus on the profitable ones to expand your share of wallet with them. What does that mean? Expand. The, the business that you do with them, turn them into strategic partners, turn them into apostles. Let them be really um, co-creators with you. Ask them questions. How can you do it better? What's competition doing where you can do a really great job? Make them strategic partners. And if you can increase retention of that profitable client base by 5%, your bottom line is going to exceed and it's going to happen organically and you don't have to work harder for it. It's just going to happen as a matter of course. And nobody knows this, but if you manage your client base according to that, it is worth working 10 times as hard as you are now and you'll make three, four, five times the profitability. You can work half as hard and make two, three, four times the profitability. And I hope that makes sense. Okay, Dawn, our next question. This comes to us from Michael, who has a few linking questions together. Uh, Michael's asking, how much should you ask for? Is it business to cover business for the next few years? Is it project specific? Or should the amount be to generally grow the business? Any advice there? Okay. Well, again, growth is not a strategy. What are you growing? Are you growing top line? That's your sales. If you're growing sales, it doesn't necessarily mean that your profitability is growing because you could discount like mad, generate a lot of sales, and still end up actually in a low profitability position. That you don't want to do. But um, in terms of how much money should you ask for, we go through this in accounting for the number phobic. We talk a little bit about it in the webinar. But the most important thing is working capital. Working capital is the amount of cash you have available to actually pay bills at, over and above your liability. So working capital is current assets minus current liabilities. I'll say that again. Working capital is current assets minus current liabilities. What can you turn into cash? That's your assets. Minus what you owe in the next 12 months. Those are your current liabilities. So Norm Brodsky, who was my interview for Chapter 10 for Numberphobic, said something that really brought me up short, but he's right. He said, if your working capital is less than one, in other words, your liabilities, your current liabilities are greater than your assets, he said, you're functionally bankrupt. So one of the, I, I want to say, constraints on how much money you should be asking for is making sure that your current assets are always greater than, excuse me, that your current assets are always greater than your current liabilities, even after you get this new loan that you're asking for, okay? Working capital should always be greater than one. Uh, and then the other thing, too, is, again, the banker investor is looking for a return on an investment. So if every dollar you invest in marketing efforts, for example, returns $1.20 to the business, that's actually a good investment. And so if you can rationalize that because your cost of acquisition is so reasonable because you can prove you can bring a new customer into your system for X, but that customer is going to generate X plus Y in terms of gross margin, then you can, in, you can, in theory, ask for an infinite amount of money. But it's about return on investment. It's not about how big the loan is. And I'm going to caution you, any time you put a dollar at risk in your business, you got to get a return on investment that is higher than your cost of capital. So, for example, 
If you invest a dollar in your business, you take a loan out, they're charging you 10% on that money, you got to get a higher return than 10% in order for it to have been worth your while. If you can prove that you can get that, the customer is going to generate, you know, 130% in um, over what it's costing you to reach out to them. Then it makes sense to get the loan. But the loan is not arbitrary. The size of the loan is never arbitrary. It's always based on how are you going to use the money and what the return on investment is going to be depending on how that you use that money. So, for example, you can also use the loan to improve processes. So where it normally takes you a month to do X, Y, Z, if you buy this software or if you, uh, if you leverage this system and technology, instead of it taking you a month, it's going to take you a day, that's a real conversation also to have with a banker or an investor. But you've got to have those numbers under your belt, and you have to know exactly how that loan money is going to be deployed and what kind of return on investment you're going to get based on how you're going to uh, deploy those assets, those loan assets. Okay, Dawn, we've got time for one last question here, and this one has been asked by multiple people attending today's session, asking about where to find market, consumer, and category data to make our business case are there any free resources of market data and industry projections? Yeah, there are. And in every industry, there is an industry trade organization. I mentioned this earlier. You should know what industry trade organization and also what publications and websites, and a lot of time they're nonprofits, so they're going to have a .org extension on them that follow trends in that industry, that have research, white papers, all sorts of stuff. And then there are going to be influencers in those industries that write articles, that give talks, that are on YouTube. So first, find the industry trade organizations, and they all have websites. And then you can call them, you can email them, and ask them who are the top three influencers that they follow, Pardon me, I would go on Twitter, I know it sounds crazy, or LinkedIn, and, and, and find that trade organization on social and see who they follow, and you can begin to see who the influencers are, and then follow them, download their white papers, and do the research that way. Or, I'm a little lazy, <laughs> and I like to find a research librarian because they're geniuses at this. And I basically give them like three or four questions and say, these are the questions I need to answer. Can you help me answer them? Where's the source data I can go to? And they're so thrilled to be working with people, and they're such super smart people. I think librarians are the great unsung heroes of our economy. Go to a business or um, science library and make a friend of the librarian and write her or him a thank you note every now and then for all their hard work. But ask them those questions, and they can do the research, or they can point you in the right direction. And within an hour or two, you could get so much information, more than you could get on your own. So those would be my recommendations. Okay, so those are all the questions that we have time for during this live webinar. If we did not have a chance to address your specific question, we recommend you connect with your SCORE mentor after today's webinar who can assist you further with answering these questions and applying these strategies and your business needs. As a reminder, we are sending this slide deck in a post-event email. We'll also include a link to the recording. The slide deck contains all of the resources, the great resources that Dawn has mentioned today in her presentation. So you can reference that as well for further assistance. So on behalf of SCORE and FedEx, I'd like to thank you all for attending today. And I'd like to give a very special thank you to Dawn Fotopoulos for presenting with us here again as well. Dawn, thank you so much. Really it was great being with everybody, Alexa. Well, thanks again, everyone. We look forward to seeing you next time. And take care.